Numerical Computation, Chapter Two, Video Number Two. In this video, we will learn a way of constructing interpolation polynomials due to Lagrange. Given a data set, in particular, given the points for the x values as x0, x1, and all the way to xn, and plus 1 such points. And using that information, we're going to define something called the cardinal functions. And they are denoted as function L0, L1, and all the way to Ln. These are functions of x, and each of them is a polynomial of degree n, and the cardinal function L with the index i is associated with the grid point xi. The main property satisfied by the cardinal function is the following. Consider the cardinal function L with index i evaluated at the point xj. And this value shall equal to delta ij, where this delta is the so-called Kronecker's delta, which is defined as following. So when the index i equals to j, and this returns the value 1. Otherwise, when i is different from j, this returns value 0. And i runs from 0, 1 all the way to n through all the given points. In other words, the cardinal function number i takes value 1 at xi and takes value 0 on all the other points. So this is something we call a locally supported feature in a discrete sense. We now look at a way of constructing these cardinal functions. Consider the function number i. So li of x can be simply written as the product of all these terms. So the terms are um, x minus xj on the numerator and xi minus xj on the denominator. And all these terms, they are multiplying with, e with each other for j from 0 to 1, accepted at the point when j equals to i, and that is excluded. So we know j from 0 to n will give us n plus 1 terms, minus 1 term, so these will be n terms. So the highest power for this cardinal function will be x to the power n. Therefore, this is a polynomial of degree n. Let's write out all the terms in this product form. So assuming now i is some index in the middle, not the first or the last few. So this product form can be written like this. So when j equals to 0, I get x minus x0 over xi minus x0. Then you increase the j by 1 and you have the term x minus x1 over xi minus x1. And the j keeps increasing until it becomes i minus 1. Then you get the term x minus xi minus 1 over xi minus xi minus 1. And then here you skip the term where j equals to i because it's not here. And then the next one will be when j equals to i plus 1, so it takes this form. And so on, let the j go all the way to n. We now verify the properties of the cardinal functions are satisfied by this construction. Let's first consider the value of li evaluated at xi. What will that be? So plug it in x equals to xi right here, 
we see we just have xi minus xj over xi minus xj. So each term in this product becomes 1, and you have n of these terms. Each one is 1, so multiply it, you get 1. So this is satisfied. Now, next, let's consider an i different from k and look at the cardinal function li evaluated at xk. Will it be zero? Let's go back. So, the product here going through j equals to zero and all the way to n. Now, if x shall equal to xk, where k does not equal to i, that means there will be one value of j as you go through all these j's. One value of j would exactly match the k value. So you will have one term which has xk minus xk on the numerator, and that term is 0. And all the other n minus 1 terms are non-zero. Then the product becomes 0. So this condition is satisfied. So this means Li evaluated at xk exactly equals to the chronic delta delta of ik. Once we have the cardinal functions, then writing out the interpolation polynomial is rather straightforward. It simply takes this form. The polynomial is a sum over all the cardinal functions, and each cardinal function is multiplied by yi, the corresponding data value associated with xi, and you add it up i from 0 to n, n plus 1 such terms. Writing out the summation sign, this means pn equals to l0 of x times y0 plus l1 of x times y1 plus l2 of x times y2 plus so on and so forth all the way to ln of x times yn. We now check if the interpolating property is satisfied. So let's evaluate this polynomial at the point xj. So now we have plug in x to be xj. We have li at xj times yi. And this is summed from i equals to 0 to n. So we see li times xj, this term here, is 0 except at one point where i exactly equal to j and it equals to 1. So actually in this whole summation sign there will be only one non-zero terms and exactly equals to 1 and when i equals to j so there will be 1 times yj which is yj and this holds for every i. So you see pn evaluated at xj exactly equals to yj, and that is exactly the interpolating property. This form of interpolation polynomial is called the Lagrange form. Let's consider an example. This is the same data set as we worked on in example one, where we constructed the interpolation polynomial using the Vandermeer matrix. And now, in this example, we want to write out the Lagrange form of the polynomial. Let's first write the grid points. So x0 is 0, x1 is 2 thirds and x2 equals to 1. And for the corresponding y values, y0 is 1, y1 is 0.5, which is here, and y2 is 0. Following the Lagrange form, we first must compute the cardinal functions. And for this example, we'll have three of them, one for each of the xi's. Let's look at the first one. 
L0 of x. Following the formula, it equals to x minus x1 times x minus x2 on the numerator and on the denominator is x0 minus x1 and x0 minus x2. You see that the term x minus x0 is not included in this cardinal function. So plug in the values for x0, x1, and x2 in here. These are the corresponding values. And you can just work it out. So the denominator becomes negative 2 thirds times negative 1, which is 2 thirds. Flip it over. It's 3 over 2 of x minus 2 over 3 times x minus 1. And the second cardinal function is constructed in a similar way. So we see that the term x minus x1 is skipped, is missing on the numerator. And the denominator basically takes the same form as the numerator and switch the axis with the x1, where 1 is exactly the index of this cardinal function. Okay, then plug in the values for these x0, x1, and x2, we get this expression, and then work out the denominator is 2 over 3 times negative 1 over 3, which is negative 2 over 9. Flip it over, and we get negative 9 over 2, x, times x minus 1. And finally, the last cardinal function associated with x2, this value here, and you see on the numerator, we skip the term x minus x2, so I have x minus x0 times x minus x1. And the denominator is the same as the numerator after switching the x into x2, which the index 2 is the index for your cardinal function. So again, plug in the numbers and uh, work out the denominator, and you get 3x times x minus 2 thirds. We can now plug in these cardinal functions into the Lagrange form and write out the polynomial P2. So P2 equals to L0 times Y0 plus L1 times Y1 plus L2 times Y2, where we have already computed the three cardinal functions and the Y0, Y1, Y2 are given data. After plugging in the numbers for the data y's and the cardinal functions. So we have, this is L0 times y0, which is 1. And this is L1 times y1, which is 0.5. And the last one is L2 times y2. And then we realize now that y2 is 0. So actually, there was no need to compute this L2 here. So we just add a 0. So this is the Lagrange form of the polynomial. Now, if you are curious about the following question, that is, we use the Lagrange form and we found the polynomial that interpolates the data. And then previously we used the von der Mond matrix and also find an interpolation polynomial for the same data set. Are they the same polynomial? Or do we end up with two different polynomials? To find the answer, one can just open this up and write it out into a polynomial of degree 2 in the standard form for each power of x. So this just takes some computation. You can open it up and collect like terms. And after some work, you will get negative 3 over 4x squared minus a quarter x plus 1. And if you go back to see the example 1 we had in last video, and you see that this is the same. So using two different constructions, we end up with the same polynomial that interpolates the data. So curious minds shall be thinking the following question. Do they always exist exactly one such polynomials? Or are they multiples of them? So this is the question that we will study later on when we look at the uniqueness of interpolation polynomials. 
Now let's be a critic and、uh, take a look at the Lagrange form, and let's talk about the pros and cons of this approach. So first, let's look at the positive side. What is good about this method? What do you think? If I say this formula is very elegant, do you agree? It is right, rather elegant. You could just write it out right away without doing anything. And the cardinal functions, you can just write it out, and they are multiplied with the corresponding y values, and you just add them up. Well, what is not so nice about this method? So keep in mind that. In the end, all these methods will be implemented in a computer code and be evaluated in a computer. So, as a computer engineer, I will be worried about computational efficiency, computational time. Is this an efficient method, or does it require rather heavy computation? I would say that the method is rather slow to compute. Why? Well, because each cardinal function is different, and each one of them must be computed differently. So the computational time is rather long, and we say that it's expensive to compute. And also, if a method is a general method, one would require some kind of a flexibility. Here, the flexibility will be. With respect to adding extra data points, does it allow me to do that? If, say, I have a data set, I had a polynomial interpolating them, and then I ran another experiment and I got one more point, and I wish to include that also into the polynomial, then what will I have to do? Could I keep the previous result and just make some modifications to adapt to the new point? No, unfortunately not. So this is another drawback for the Lagrange form. That is, it's not flexible in this sense. If you change a point x j or you add an additional point to your data set, you have to recompute all the cardinal functions and throw away all the previous computations. So. Keep this critic in mind, and next lecture we will be looking at a method that's exactly designed to overcome this shortcoming, that would offer some flexibility with respect to adding additional datas in your dataset.